Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. gambling. That was his whole life. I suppose you could say that was his whole life. A big gamble. Freeman was a person who had an absolute passion for gambling, in particular racing. He was a likeable bloke. Had a lot of good characteristics about him, but you know, like a lot of professional gamblers do, the ball got a shock inside dog. <laughs> This is the story of George Freeman, a colourful racing identity who ruled Sydney for a generation. And Michael Sayers, AKA Melbourne Mick, a daring gambler who believed it was time for a change in the Harbour City. They shared a love of horse racing and bookmaking, but both suffered with addictions that would control their lives and contribute to their deaths. In this episode of Suburban Gangsters, we explore the life and crimes of two high-rolling gamblers, George Freeman and Mick Sayers. Freeman was a killer, race fixer, SP bookmaker, and one of the men who ran Sydney in the corrupt and dangerous days of the 60s and 70s. Mick Sayers was also a killer, race fixer and SP bookmaker. But unlike Freeman, he was also a drug dealer. He thought he could take on Sydney's organised crime scene, including Freeman, and win. Both men would find themselves on the wrong end of a gun. I went in there and come out there. A pretty lucky miss. Do you think they meant to kill him? I think they meant to kill me. Well, I'll show you me. I'll show you the clothes I shot in. See what you think you saw. No one's ever seen these. Probably. Thought bottom like to get these. On Anzac Day 1979, an enemy made a fatal error. He shot Freeman in the face, but failed to kill him. The shooter was a crim named Jackie Muller. He was the stepfather of a woman Freeman was having an affair with. He wasn't particularly happy with George Freeman having the affair with her. The problem was that Jack himself was not uh, particularly innocent in all of this matter. He had a relationship with Lena that some might question, um, and some people actually put the shooting down to jealousy. Muller knew that he'd made a very, very serious mistake. He had failed. Freeman was going to exact revenge. So Muller, it's, it's said, sat in his home, drinking himself into a stupor on a daily basis, knowing that one day there'd be the knock on the door or the tap on the shoulder at some point and he would be shot dead. He was right. Six weeks later, Muller was executed in his car on his driveway 
with three bullets to his head. Freeman refused to answer when police questioned him, but it was widely understood that he'd ordered the hit. George Freeman had learned to stand his ground early in life. Freeman was born in Annandale and grew up in a deprived childhood. His father deserted them at a very early age. The mother remarried a few years later, but the stepfather died as well, causing the family greater financial hardship. For young George, crime was a means of escape from the poverty he was born into. He stole cars, fenced stolen goods, and hustled in pool halls for money. He was small for his age, and that made him a target for the older boys. But that belied a ferocious nature. I grew up in Annandale, Young Street, Annandale, which is the same street that George Freeman was from. Even in those days, George was a little fellow, but with uh, an extreme propensity for violence. In fact, one of my relations told me the story that he got in, into a fight with a, a kid who was bigger than him, but he got the kid down and then proceeded to drive his head into the gutter on several occasions to the point that the other kids stopped him because they feared that uh, he would have killed him. Even back then, he was just a vicious little turd, you know. When his mother found him a job as a stable boy with a horse trainer, it began a lifetime connection with the racing industry. But it wasn't long before George returned to his old ways and found himself back before the courts. This time, he was sent to the infamous Gosford Boys Home. It's a very brutal environment. Back in those days, it was seen as quite OK for the older boys to, to harm these younger kids in all sorts of ways, sexual, physical, the lot. Inside the boys' home, George befriended another vicious kid called Stanley John Smith. The two became lifelong friends and partners in crime. There was little talk of ever going straight. Freeman boasted he would be the biggest crook ever. However, his bravado exceeded his ability. George's early career gave no indication really of what he would become because, frankly, as a criminal, he was inept. He, uh, he had a string of firearm offences against him. He couldn't burgle a house without being caught. And he, everything he tried as a criminal was a disaster. George spent much of his 20s in jail. During a stretch in Long Bay Jail for safe-breaking, he fell in with another Gosford Boys Home graduate, Lenny McPherson. McPherson was about 10 years older. And certainly McPherson was a more experienced person when they met and would have provided that opportunity for the broadening of the careers. Lenny McPherson uh, told George that uh, he wasn't the very best of criminals. He was always getting caught and he should take on SP bookmaking. And as it turned out, it was extremely good advice. Until 1931, punters could only place a bet on a horse race if they were physically at the racetrack, and only with a registered bookie. That inconvenience led to the rise of SP, or starting price bookmakers. An SP bookmaker is a bookie who'll take bets, not authorised, not legal, uh, take, takes bets in pubs, clubs, barber shops, etc. Um, is a man you could actually get a bet on with. You'll see them in any pub, really. When Freeman came out of jail, he joined forces with Lenny McPherson and Stan Smith. This trio became known as The Team and governed the East Coast criminal milieu. With the help of corrupt police, McPherson oversaw prostitution and racketeering. George followed Lenny's advice and went into the starting price bookmaking game, while Smith played the role of enforcer. The Sydney push, um, as wild and, and vicious as it was, it loved order. It, 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 it needed the, the connections between corrupt police, politicians um, and the villains and so forth. It needed a certain amount of order because otherwise it was chaos. So you couldn't afford to have people running around like loose cannons. 
One such loose cannon was a violent psychopath called Stuart John Regan. He threatened the interests of the team by exposing corrupt police, some of whom provided the protection the team relied upon. So he, he I think he made himself a marked man at that time. And funnily enough, he was, he was shot in the laneway outside an illegal gambling place. And out at that gambling place that night, of all people, Lenny McPherson, George Freeman and Stan Smith all happened to have been there that night. But no one could ever be pinned for it. George seldom got his hands dirty. But when his interests were at stake, he didn't hesitate to do what was necessary. It would be another 11 years before George and the team were called upon to catch and kill another of their own. The hitman, Christopher Dale Flannery, who just so happened to be one of Mick Sayer's best mates. George Freeman and Mick Sayers shared a love of gambling, but while Freeman was becoming Sydney's top SP bookie, Sayers was running gambling inside Melbourne's Pentridge prison. Former inmate turned author Ray Mooney met Sayers inside Pentridge. Mick was the SP bookie in prison, and uh, and that's and to to know what it means to be the SP bookie in a major prison, and I'm talking Pentridge here. You need to know a little bit about prisoners. You're not allowed to survive as the SP bookie unless you can work in with the screws and you can work in with the heavy crims. SP bookmaking was in Sayers' blood. He was born in 1943 and like George, Mick was a keen student of racing. His father worked as an illegal bookmaker and the family lived so close to Caulfield Racetrack that young Mick could hear the horses jump out of the barrier. He was one of four boys. His younger brother, Robbie, remembers Mick as being fun, sporty and popular in school, but somehow always in trouble. He's always causing some sort of problem for my father and as he got older. and I can remember one, we both went to Delar, Sal in Malvern, and I remember one year we went to the school uh, speech night and on, on the way home he says, put his arm, he said, listen, I'm, we're not going to walk home, we'll drive home. And I said, I would have been about 10, I suppose. He would have been 15, 16. And I said, we haven't got a car. He said, don't worry about that. He said, I'll break into one and we'll, we'll drive home. And I started crying and he put his arm around me. He said, oh, don't worry, don't worry about it. He said, we'll walk home. And that's just, he looked after me. He said, he didn't want to take me because I didn't want to go with him. It was a very, uh, I've never forgotten it to this day. Mick was constantly at odds with the law, but had managed to avoid reform school despite chalking up convictions for car theft, housebreaking, safe blowing and receiving stolen goods. But his luck ran out when he was 23. I can remember being at home and uh, the police running down the sideway uh, I can remember them coming down the sideway of the house with a bobcat and digging up the backyard. They're obviously looking for something. It would have been money, but they never found anything. And, uh, uh, yeah, he got, he got uh, 12 or 13 years for that. Did seven of them, I think. Sayers was sent to Melbourne's Pentridge Prison, where he shared the yard with the likes of criminal psycho Mark Chopper-Reed and mass murderer Dennis Allen. You only prospered in Pentridge if you understood the system and the power structures. Mick survived for years as the SP bookie. Now that lets you know a lot about Mick's ability to communicate and to work with people. The SP bookie also had to be able to, to handle himself because if someone didn't pay a debt, you had to confront them. And if you were the SP bookie and you didn't confront someone over a debt, you, would, you just lost that job. And Mick on many occasions fronted up. In fact, he had one of the great all-time fights with a very hardened uh, uh, prisoner, Stephen Sellers, who, who was one of the best fight, street fighters in the game. Uh, and he handled himself pretty well. They came out even. It was a ferocious fight where they both, they both came out even. This is in Mick's early days. So Mick was no uh, shrinking violet. 
future contract killer named Christopher Dale Flannery arrived in Pentridge towards the end of Sayer's sentence. The two met in H Division, the punishment wing of the jail. It was a prison within a prison, designed to break the will of all who passed through its bluestone walls. I think it was more ruthless. He didn't care after he'd been in there. He was more so I could tell after H Division. Before then, he, he could cope with most things. I'm not saying he didn't cope, but he, he was a different, far different person. It's hard to pinpoint why, but he was, it was very, he was very hard and ruthless after that. H Division left its mark on every inmate, but Flannery had taken on the screws and despite terrible punishment, he'd never kowtowed. And Sayers idolised him. For all his experience as a criminal, uh, he, he was routinely led around by the nose by other crooks. Uh, and Chris Flannery was a perfect example. But Flannery got into his ear and basically told him, or insinuated, that the Sydney organised crime scene, the McPhersons, the Freemans, they could be rolled. That they were older men and a, a challenge from young, fit blokes like Michael Sayers and Chris Flannery could go up from Melbourne and take over this established criminal network that not even the Mafia could crack ten years before. You can see how foolish, you can see where this is going to end up. Flannery had successfully planted the seed and when Sayers was released in 1973, he decided his race was run in Melbourne. A stint in Sydney would be better for his health. Well, he came out of jail and he said, well, he, he couldn't stay in Melbourne because he'd be uh, persecuted down here. He said, they'll end up shooting me. And uh, he said, I'm going to move to Sydney, which he did. So Sayers left his wife and two children and headed north. But Melbourne Mick would soon learn that Sydney's underworld was a very different place to his hometown. And it was the crooked cops, not the villains, who made the rules. If you took on the crooks in Sydney, you took on these cops too. Most gamblers experience highs and lows, but George Freeman rarely had a bad day. In Freeman's time, there wasn't a harness race in 10 years that wasn't fixed. His strike rate as a punter was 99%. Today, Sydney is one of the safest cities in the world. But back in the 70s, crime was run like an informal state enterprise in New South Wales, as corrupt politicians, judges and police mingled freely at the racetrack and in illegal gaming clubs. The team was determined to maintain that status quo by whatever means necessary. George Freeman was a person who, from the early 1970s, developed quite a lot of influence, um, both with politicians and with police. He made sure that, along with McPherson, that politicians were looked after, that police were looked after, and that he didn't cause problems. Freeman ran the biggest illegal gambling operation, partly because he ran a good game, but also because he could shut down unauthorised rivals with a call to his police minders. Jeff Schuberg monitored Freeman's activities during the team's reign. And if any individual wanted to set up a two-up game, and I'm talking about a major two-up game, not something in the back lane of a pub on the spur of the moment, but uh, from established premises, or an illegal game, they needed George's approval. And they just didn't do it unless they got it. If they set it up without him, he closed them down. His thriving SP bookmaking business was integrated with another sideline, race fixing. Under Freeman's time, the network of SPs became substantial. 
all of a sudden it wasn't just a sort of friendly Fred at the pub. There were this group that all operated under Freeman's control. So there were literally hundreds of bookmakers uh, running around Sydney. So essentially George Freeman was running his own TAB. Although he claimed he was never an SP bookmaker once he'd got organised in the 70s, rather what he did was he provided protection to those bookmakers. He provided them with prices and some feedback. He would also be rigging races, so he knew how to manipulate the prices. But the fact is that he still ran a very large SP network. Meanwhile, Sayers had recently arrived in Sydney from Melbourne, full of dash, and got right down to business. He returned to what he knew best, bookmaking. He also ran illegal casinos in Sydney and on the Gold Coast. With pockets full of cash, he came to notice as one of Sydney's biggest punters. He told me he was at a, a, a legal casino in Sydney and he was playing with $10,000 chips and he was playing next to a bookmaker. And the bookmaker said, why don't you have a decent bet? Unbeknownst to the bookmaker, the chips, they didn't have $100,000 chips. And he'd made an arrangement that the 10,000 were really 100,000. And he couldn't tell him. He just kept playing and, you know, mind his own business. But he was a $100,000 a chip gambler. Sayers may have won big some days, but he owed a lot of money. He turned to his old prison mate, Christopher Flannery, for help. Flannery, now also living in Sydney, introduced Sayers to his contacts in the drug business. Danny Chubb was the major heroin trafficker in Sydney in and around the 1980s. You could make more money out of illicit drugs in one week than people could over a 12-month period on many armed hold-ups. Chubb extended credit to Sayers, who started dealing heroin to rescue his cash flow and his SP bookmaking. Business started to look up when Freeman approached him with a large bet he wanted to place. But it was a bet Freeman could never lose. He'd fixed the race. Sayers now owed George a million dollars, a penny of which he didn't have. Sayers was in desperate need of cash at the time. He owed a lot of money in Sydney. And a quick fix horse race with a quick return of a lot of money uh, seemed to appeal to Mick Sayers. He thought he'd found the answer with a conspiracy that became known as the Fine Cotton Affair. It was a race fixing uh, business uh, that involved swapping over a picnic nag, fine cotton, with another better performed horse. The thing had been sorted out between a couple of accomplices of Sayers and a Brisbane trainer of ill repute, Aidan Hayatana. Sayers shared the tip with George Freeman and others. A win on this race would help Sayers to clear his ledger. But then things began to fall apart. Just a few days before the big race, Dashing Solitaire was injured and a horse called Bold Personality was hastily purchased. But there was a problem. To begin with, the two horses, Fine Cotton and Bold Personality, looked nothing like each other. Bold Personality is a bay gelding, clearly marked with its brand on its shoulder. It also has a white marking on its forehead. Fine Cotton is a brown gelding with two white hind feet. To pull off the hoax, they used hair dye to colour the coat and painted on white socks. It seemed to satisfy the stewards before the race, despite their concern over a sudden rush of money for the horse. Fine Cotton still in front past the 200. Harbour Gold inch by inch is starting to pick him up now. Harbour Gold getting up to Fine Cotton with 100 to go and they'll be fighting it out. Fine Cotton won't get in. Harbour Gold, Fine Cotton, Fine Cotton's going to go on it. Oh, he's just in front. He made one by one. No, so there's nothing in it. Fine Cotton had won and the conspirators stood to win $1.5 million. But the day wasn't over yet. The painted on white socks had initially fooled the stewards, but not for long. And George Freeman made certain of that. The sting with fine cotton sounded simple. 
ring in a good horse for the bush ruffy, and then back the good horse to win a fortune. But Hayden Hightana now says there may have been a double sting. Some bookies and punters knew a ring in was on, and by making sure that it was discovered, they were the ones who collected the fortune. Well, George knew it was going to be a disaster, and he sent half a dozen blokes up to Brisbane, go and stand at the rails, legal farm, on the day, and when bold personality stuck its nose in front to win the race as fine cotton, they started screaming and yelling, ring in, ring in, stewards, wake up to yourselves. Well, the stewards did rouse from their slumber, and the first thing they noticed was the fine cotton didn't look anything like fine cotton. And they disqualified fine cotton. The horse that ran second would have been the favourite. was paying five to one. And guess who backed it? George Freeman. And he won a mozza. And Mick Sayers, he did the lot. All the great plungers are orchestrated with complete secrecy. Fine Cotton was different. Sayers told too many people. He had it going for maybe one and a half million. I think he owed three million through uh, uh, through SPing on rigged races, and he was and he didn't realise it. So he was trying to get something bad. He had it going for about 1.5 million, which might have wiped his slate too. That might have been about enough for him to get out of the hole. The mail is that uh, Sayers uh, was stood to gain the most, but Freeman, being a wily operator, uh, he decided that there was an opportunity for him to cash in on uh, what would turn out to be Mick Sayers' misery. Sayers was in serious trouble and would soon be driven to desperate measures to service his growing debt. By the early 1980s, George Freeman was unassailable in Sydney and there was a period of peace. Freeman held the unofficial franchise for illegal gaming in town. And he could also drive away competitors with corrupt influence or muscle. He lived like a businessman displaying the symbols of his success. George certainly spent a lot of his life trying to eradicate those ugly memories and deprivation of his childhood. He, uh, he was a man who surrendered totally to consumerism. He could break a recession single-handedly. He spent so well. He owned a big house at Yowie Bay overlooking the water. It was extensively and expensively furnished. The money that poured in, not only from George's SP bookmaking rackets, but fixing races was another good earner for him. But the money he picked up just weekly from illegal casinos for the protection, some of them used to pay up to $5,000 a week. It was all so brazen in New South Wales back then. Corrupt police, judges and politicians provided a force field of protection. It didn't come for free. Freeman and McPherson had learnt in boys' homes that informers prospered. And Lenny, AKA Mr Big, was a serial police informer. Lenny's lagging on friends and enemies provided cover for Freeman too, even if he wasn't providing information. Jeff Schuberg was one of the few police prepared to break ranks and bring Freeman and the team to justice. Over a period of 10 to 15 years, um, I monitored Freeman's activities. Between Smith, Freeman and McPherson, they also collected money from casinos and George collected that money personally. And I can remember times when I'd follow him from his home and he'd drive along General Holmes Drive past the airport uh, sitting on sometimes 90 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour. And I used to say to my colleagues, we'd be better off locking George up for uh, driving in a speed dangerous to the public than trying to get a brief on him with anything else because George at that stage was protected. He was protected by crooked cops. And if we ever got anything on him, then someone was helping him out and they were feeding information to him about our activities. So journalist Bob Bottom set out to expose the depth of corruption in New South Wales and the profitable relationship between the state and criminals like George Freeman. But messing with Freeman carried a health warning. My disclosures and some of the work I did behind the scenes made it difficult for him 
to deal with people. He was trying to mix with politicians and people like that. And of course, once it became, he came subject to the attention he did in 78, 79, a lot of those people were starting to cut him off and he, oh, he was very annoyed about that. He blamed me for that. He sent me a message once, and it's like something out of The Godfather. And that was, um, he actually sent someone to um, um, throw petrol over our pet cat and set it alight and couldn't help but to uh, get someone to ring up the next day and uh, just just to let him know that he did it, you know, but how do you prove it, you know? Oh, so it actually did happen? Oh, all that sort of, we lived for years with all that sort of stuff. But George is probably one I feared the most. I can tell you that Lenny McPherson uh, intervened a number of times. Lenny was smart in the sense that they didn't want something to happen to me because of what would happen afterwards, but he stopped George a couple of times. In 1983, the gaming squad, led by Jeff Schuberg, was given a green light to raid Freeman's home. George lived in this place at Yowie Bay, and it had a high wall all the way around it. It was monitored with cameras. He had guard dogs. I guess George thought at this particular point in time he was fairly well protected. He also had coppers looking after him and feeding him information if there was anyone onto him. So I decided to knock him off and uh, one of my workmates at the time went to the gate with a couple of other guys, threw some meat over for the dogs and in the meantime we had people going over the back fence through an adjoining property. When they walked into the room they'd been bedding but he had all this paper and it was designed when you put in a tray of water to disintegrate and they'd thrown all the bedding sheets into the tray of water. Everything had gone. But there was one sheet in front of George's sort of seat um, that still had bets on it. And uh, my mate, Bob Nicholson, was able to grab it. He had a bit of a struggle with George, who tried to jam it in a coffee cup and get rid of it. But we retrieved about three quarters of it, put him before the court with the others. He pleaded not guilty, and we convicted him again. It wasn't the most serious offence in the world at the time, you know, starting price betting. And he went to Sutherland Court and he was convicted. He was pretty dirty about the whole thing. And, uh, but he just continued to operate. This is what they used to do. You couldn't close them down, you couldn't stop them. Freeman got off with a fine, but his world was changing. Drugs were steadily taking over in Sydney and with this new business came people who would not obey the old rules. Thugs and hitmen like Christopher Rentakill Flannery, who threatened the status quo that had made George rich and untouchable. McPherson and Freeman took Flannery under their wing, uh, primarily as a means of trying to keep some control of him. Uh, they were aware of his reputation. They didn't want the problems he could cause in Sydney. And they figured by giving him some form of employment, they might be able to control him. Flannery, like Regan, was an uncontrollable individual. He came up from Melbourne and, and he wanted to make a mark on the Sydney scene. I don't think he really cared what he got involved in or who he got involved with. If you had him in your camp, you couldn't uh, trust him to sort of stay with you because he'd be just as likely to go to the opposition. Flannery had a well-deserved reputation when he hit Sydney. A cold-blooded killer offering to kill anyone for $50,000. But when he shot a police officer, he crossed a line. Sydney's a place where you work with the police. Melbourne's a place where if you do work with the police, you th no one wants to know you. You know, most people think that you're a dog if you work with the police in Melbourne. Up in Sydney, you're an idiot if you don't work with the police. There's a world of difference. Just like Stuart John Regan a decade earlier, Freeman and the team decided that Flannery had to go. In the early 1980s, Mick Sayer's gambling addiction had him in a vice-like grip. The money he made selling drugs couldn't keep pace with his losses and he owed millions. Gambling's a terrible thing because you get more and more arousal by chasing your losses, which seems ridiculous. It seems like a, 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 a contradiction. 
But as you lose your mojo, for want of a better word, what's occurring is that you become more desperate. In desperation, Sayers turned once more to friend and hitman Chris Flannery. Mick needed his help to erase a huge debt he owed to drug trafficker Danny Chubb. 42-year-old Daniel Michael Chubb was gunned down outside his harbourside home in High Street, Millers Point. Police say he was hit by at least three bullets from a high-powered rifle and died instantly. Part of an investigation into Danny Chubb's death revealed that Chubb had extended $500,000 worth of credit to Michael Sayers. Killing Danny Chubb solved his debt problem, but taking out Sydney's biggest heroin dealer had turned the spotlight on Sayers, and other forces were preparing to move against him. And pretty much it came down at the end of the day to competition between different criminal gangs for control of the illicit drug market, and they would not stop short of murder. Among the key players was drug dealer Barry McCann. He replaced Chubb as Sayers' heroin supplier. But before long, Sayers was back in debt to the tune of two and a half million dollars. I guess his main downfall was his, his gambling and his rip-offs of, uh, you know, friends and acquaintances that he, he did business with. And unfortunately, that probably ended his demise. Ever the gambler, Sayers went all in on one final play. It was risky and involved pulling a fast one on Barry McCann. When McCann arrived at the meeting with Sayers, there was heroin worth $400,000 in the boot of his car. Mick Sayers kept uh, Barry McCann talking in the uh, Australia Youth Hotel in Glebe. Um, they were there to exchange heroin, but they talked horses. When they went back out to the car, Someone had uh, leave it open the boot and taken the heroin. Um, Mick Sayers said that he was as surprised as Barry was to see this and, and as disappointed. But uh, Barry McCann just simply said, work back the gear or you're dead. In 1985, Mick Sayers was fast running out of mates. He owed $2.5 million around the country, courtesy of his gambling addiction. To try and turn around some fast cash, he'd recklessly stolen $400,000 worth of heroin from major Sydney drug dealer Barry McCann. Mick knew it was just a question of time before someone would pull the trigger and he'd be dead. Well, I could see that he wasn't, he was very uh, apprehensive, he was jumpy, he wasn't the same. You know, normally he's the, he's the life of the party, he organised everything, he, what are we going to do? We'd go out for lunch, we'd have barbecues, he looked after the kids, he was very good with kids, it was unbelievable how good he was. Uh, he was very kind and considerate with kids. And I said to him, I said, listen, I said, there's something wrong. He said, oh, yes. And just, this is after the fact, you know, I thought about it later. You know, months later, he said, yeah, he said, uh, I'm off. I said, what do you mean you're off? He said, you know, I'm off. I said, well, why don't you go away and get on a plane and go? He, he, he said, listen, when you're off, you're off. On Saturday night, two gunmen ambushed Michael Sayers as he returned to his luxury home at Bronte in Sydney's eastern suburbs. He was shot twice, once in the back as he ran, and then from point-blank range in the neck when he fell to the ground. Sayers was a gambler, was unemployed, and yet earned property worth more than half a million dollars. He also owned four racehorses and a brand new Mercedes. Now I got a call about 12 o'clock from my younger brother, who was living with Michael at the time, and he said he'd been shot and killed. So I got, on, I got my, old, my other brother, who lived in Melbourne with me, and we got a plane at six in the morning, the first plane to Sydney. Very distressing at the time. We, yeah, as you can imagine, it's, it was sort of surreal. It had a great effect on his children, um, on his father, his brothers, my wife. Um, 
stopped, has it? No. Because his murder remains unsolved. Well, it, it is, but in my mind, it's not. You know, I, I, I know what happened, and I was told very early in the piece what had happened by certain people. And there was, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. You can't do much about it, really. Michael Sayers' gambling addiction overwhelmed his loyalty to friends and business associates who finally abandoned him. In contrast, George Freeman was the image of success and portrayed himself as a legitimate professional punter. However, behind the scenes, he was planning a murder. Flannery's family raised the alarm last night when the 36-year-old ex-Melbourne crime figure failed to return from a business appointment. His wife told police that appointment was with racing identity George Freeman. This morning, Freeman's fortress-like Yowie Bay mansion was first on the list for detectives from the gang war task force. They searched the grounds and spent an hour talking to Freeman, his family and lawyer. Task Force Chief, Inspector John Anderson, emerging satisfied that Flannery kept no appointment yesterday at the residence. Well, it's highly probable that he has been killed, now, judging on the spate of killings we've had since last November, but uh, we can't confirm at this stage one way or the other. Just three months after Mick Sayers was murdered, rent kill met the same fate. There's little doubt that George Freeman was instrumental in Flannery's death. But whether he pulled the trigger remains a mystery. George Freeman was a very cunning man, and he was, Flannery was still employed as his minder stroke standover man. And what we were told is that um, Flannery and George Freeman used to regularly take a sauna together. And on one of these occasions when they were having a sauna together, Freeman uh, casually mentioned to Flannery that he had access to a high-powered machine pistol and, in fact, said to Flannery, are you interested in, of course, he registered a positive response. Ultimately, Flannery went to Freeman's home and Freeman went and retrieved the machine pistol. So Flannery fully expected a gun to be presented to him in his presence, but what he did not expect was to be shot with the same firearm. Freeman was linked to notorious hitman Chris Flannery. You're not going to say Fr Flannery is a friend of mine. Rendekill, he wasn't. A, he's not. He wasn't a friend of mine. He was, I was just like a number of other people throughout Australia that was that was frightened of him. I only met the man in the sauna room. With Flannery gone, the threat was eliminated. But Freeman was dealing with another more personal demon. He was hooked on prescription drugs. His secret habit began in 1979, after Jackie Muller shot him in the face. He was prescribed pethidine, a highly addictive painkiller. The problem for George was that he was heavily asthmatic, which made pethidine a very dangerous drug. When you look at the side effects of pethidine, one of the major side effects of regular use is it tends to, to um, dampen down the risk respiratory system. You start feeling as if you're not getting enough air. Pethidine had more of an effect on his respiration than the asthma did. Freeman suffered an asthma attack at his townhouse in Sydney South this morning. It brought on a fatal heart attack. St Stephen's Uniting Church in the city was packed for George Freeman's funeral. There was his best mate, Lenny, the big fella McPherson. I think the greatest gift God is George Freeman to me. When Freeman died in 1990, he was under investigation by the National Crime Authority for bribery, corruption, illegal gambling, tax evasion and murder. But George managed to avoid it all. He hadn't been in a jail cell since 1968. Never again would any crim run Sydney 
the way that George Freeman and his mates had. 